You know, in the last two sessions, what I've been doing, we've been talking about thanks, uh, thanksgiving, praise, and worship. You know, three words. And often we just grossed over. The, we just like, yeah, we, just, we don't think it's that important. Well, we're going to relook again, and today we've come to the third installment. From Thanksgiving, we go to praise, and now we're the end of the worship. But just a quick reminder. Psalm 100, how many remember Psalm 100? And we were looking at Psalm 100 as the main center of this series of preaching. It's Psalm 102. The word down there tells us, worship the Lord with gladness. I like the word. It's, it's not just a option. The word is a command. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Amen. You know, sometimes our songs may not be the most musical. That doesn't matter. How, how many know that? It is about joy that the Lord is pleased with. And Psalm 100 verse 3 reminds us, you know, when we can come with God with a joy, when we know that the Lord, He is God. It is He that has made us. Somebody say amen to that. And what only made us? Not we ourselves. Please remind us. You were not made with the hands of men, not by the will of men, not by the intent of men, but by God Himself. And that we are today His people. How many know that? Well, only a few hands. Amen. We are His people. You all should get excited when you hear that. And the sheep of His pastures. You know, this word is so important. Because Psalm 23 reminds us, when the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. Wow. Let the red words resonate a bit. It took me, even I got saved for 10 years already, in 1998 to understand that I mentioned the word. And Psalm 104 tells us that we are to enter His gates with thanks, giving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. You notice, just quick summary, worship is the objective of everything that we do. Right? But, first we must know who God really is. And this is a challenge for us all the time. Who God is in your life. All the time. Because too often we have too many other gods on our altar. The God that comes from our jobs, the God that comes from our finances, the God that comes from circumstances and situation. Hallelujah. But when your focus is right, you know that there's only one God and that's none besides Him. And it, this is so important. So when we look at this, we know that thanksgiving is the gate. And we are reminded, again, the thanksgiving gate for Poles, four bases, brass rings and all. And there, the curtain to enter. And the curtain, we knew it was for four colours. Leviticus tell, tells us of this. Four colours. Sorry, Exodus 27, 16 tells four colours. And it reminds us, brass always about redemption. And the four colours speaks of Jesus. Remember we went over this? There was fine... Find what? Linen, white colour. Speaks of righteousness of our Lord. There is blue, the colour of divinity. Purple, the colour of kingship. Red, the colour of His blood when He comes as a suffering saviour for us. You know, as we know this, we cannot be but a people of praise and a people of power. But yet sometimes this word thanksgiving, praise and worship, I said already over the last two sessions, we tend to mix it all up. And we do not understand the distinctive significance in each and every one of them. You know why we give thanks, God? Why we come with thanksgiving? I already said this, what scripture reminds us. We come with thanksgiving to acknowledge that God is good. Amen. 
and we come with praise and we do that, we acknowledge that God is great and His greatness. And we, and when we worship God, get this in mind, we acknowledge that God is God. That He is omniscience. That He is omnipotent. That He is omnipresent. In essence, God is holy. God sets Himself apart. And we are called to have this attitude of thankfulness. Many times we, we only are thankful for the good things that happen. But the attitude of thankfulness, and I quoted 1 Thessalonians 5.18, that tells us, in everything, give thanks. Not for everything. We can only give thanks for good things. But the Lord says, have the attitude. In everything, be yeah, have the attitude to have a thankful heart. Amen. You know, thankful heart is so important. And we understand this. If we don't have a thankful heart, a heart of thanksgiving, nothing works. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, you should always have a thankful heart. Why? I just shouted just now. For the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. And what? Come on, come on. His truth goes from generation to generation to all generations. Do you know this is what we call the immutability of God? Immutability is such a big word. It really means the consistency of God. And God is so constant in this that we can have the assurance that He changes not. Amen? If we don't get this perspective, I want to tell you this, we can't even have that attitude of thankfulness. We can't even have the heart of thanksgiving. And we will never be able to come up into His presence. And you must know this. You know, last week I spoke about there are seven keys, very important. How many wrote it down? About praise. Mm. First, very quickly, I'm not going to go to the whole teaching again. Enough to always keep in mind. Our praise offers a throne for God in our lives. Amen. Just now we just sang it. And He ascends, not only His heavenly throne, He ascends the very throne of our life. When we give Him totality in our life, He ascends and He's enthroned in our lives. The second thing is important. How many remember? Praise actually has a purpose. It's for this purpose that through which God blesses us and brings us victory. The third thing about this is how do we praise the Lord with our tongue? And when we begin to praise the Lord, our tongue becomes a manifestation of the glory that's within us. Amen. How many know that in a tongue there's life and death? In a tongue we either bless or tongue we can curse. But you know where does the tongue speak? Are the abundance of our heart. If your heart is without thankfulness, your tongue cannot begin to speak praise and glory to God. How many understand that? Yeah. Amen. And so, next one about praise is what? Praise requires a sacrifice. When you don't feel like praising, the Bible says praise. It takes a sacrifice. But I tell you this, I've learned one thing. In every sacrifice, as we give praise, we must understand the price has already been paid. It's not been paid by you. It's paid by Christ. A cost was required. That's why the price was paid. And very important. Now, a choice has to be made. You choose, the Bible says. You choose life. You choose death. You choose what you want to do. You choose that you're going to praise God. Make the sacrifice even though you don't feel like praising Him. There are times when everything looks bad and you don't feel like Praising, yes, a sacrifice. But when you begin to do, praise becomes a spiritual weapon. A spiritual weapon not only to silence, but to bind the enemy. I talked about it last week. If, 
If you can't remember, go back and listen to it. It should be up on our, our website. You can follow by uh, on YouTube. But praise also prepares the way for God's supernatural intervention in the things in our lives. How many know that we saw it in Scripture? Remember when Paul and Silas began to praise God in prison, when they were locked up, chained up, everything will happen. They went beyond what their heart told them. Twelve midnight. Oh, they begin to praise. And the Bible says that praise was so loud that all the prisoners could hear it. So it's not like, praise you God, praise you God. It was, praise you God. And when we praise God, we are called, praise is like, sh- the Hebrew word, remember I talked about it, it's like shooting out. So let your praise be outrageous. Amen. Don't just praise God. Praise God. If it's within you, let it be outrageous. And God, I tell you, begin to do that supernatural intervention. I won't tell you, He brings deliverance. In Paul and Silas' time, the prison began to shake. The chains just fell off. The doors just opened. God made the way of deliverance. Somebody say, Amen. And I round up by saying last week, when are we to praise God? The Bible says every day, continuously, continually all the time. All the time, continually. How to praise God? With our total being. With all that's within us, praise the Lord. You see, you don't praise the Lord with, just, it's all that's within us. Praise is an outflowing of all that's within us. Amen? With the praise with the whole heart. With the praise with understanding. With the praise what? With our hands lifted up, with joy, with our mouth, with lips, with all praise. Important. Dance, timbo. You know, at the seminar here next week, not a week after, Prophetess Laura Ellison, in the afternoon session on Friday, will be teaching about prophetic worship. You know what she said to me? Tell the people who are coming to the seminar. Bring their tambourines, bring their flags, bring all, because we've got to understand the dimension of dance, to praise God with symbol, praise God with every instrument, not just our mouth alone. Somebody say amen. Yes. And you must understand why this is so important. I tell you this. Do you know, we understand who's to praise Him? All of us, creation. But you know, we sang that song. In the heavenlies too. Who does not praise God? I ended with that last week. I remember. Satan, Satan and followers. Are there any followers of Satan here? I can't hear you. No! Say it aloud. Because you're making a statement to the devil. No! Second, who would not praise the Lord? Because he says, Always breath, that means the dead will not praise God. Are you alive here? Yes. Amen. And we are alive because Jesus is alive. And when we appropriate that life, we appropriate resurrection power. And I want to tell you, resurrection power raises the power, raises the authority, raises the glory of God. And I want to tell you, every obstacle you're facing, every situation, because God inhabits the praises of His people. Somebody shout, Amen. But today we come to another, the most ultimate destination of where thanksgiving and praise is going. Worship. How many promises, covenant promises are there in the Bible? 7,487. Minimum. But you know how many times The word worship is used in the Bible, or alluded to it. 8,629 times. Oh, you're all like, not. (laughs) See this. The promises God wants to give you. 7,487. But yet, worship mentioned 8,629 times. 
So worship must be very, very important. Someone shout, very important. Yeah. Do you know the Bible talks of worship as a daily human activity? Yeah. You know, why do you have worship as a human activity? It comes from actually three things. One is awareness of God being close. If God is close, what is, you cannot help but worship. You see, the problem is not God being close. God is close all the time. The Word of God reminds us where two or three are gathered in His name. He's right here. But do you sense that God is here? Are you aware of the closeness of God? Second, that we can come as an activity of worship when we have experienced God's mercy in our life. How many of you have not not experienced mercy in your life? Well, I'll tell you one thing great. If you believe in Jesus and you're saved today, that's God's mercy. That's God's mercy. He did not account our sins to us. But He gave by His grace mercy. And not only mercy, but by His grace that we can truly become now children of a living God. Amen. So every time you remember that you should be worshipping because you have already experienced God's mercy in your life. Sometimes you've got to look at it. Ask yourself, instead of looking at problems and situations and things, go back. Thanksgiving comes when you begin to see the grace and mercy of God in our lives. If you do not understand this, I want to tell you this. Worship will never begin in your life. And the next most important thing is we worship because He's here in our midst. When He's here in our midst, His power, His authority, His presence, everything. Because He's the Alpha, He is the Omega. He is the author, the beginning of our faith. And He's the finisher of our faith. And something to always remember, when Jesus is present, not only His authority, not only His power, not only His presence, but everything that we need is already been provided for. Amen? That's why I like those three words. I call it PAP. Not because I believe in the People's Action Party. I'm not selling this. But I believe in praise. Uh, I believe in the promises. How many know God has promises? In promises, there's provision. I believe in abundance. And I believe in the providence of God. You see, if you don't believe in this, then you can never take your eyes off situation and problem and begin to put your eyes upon Jesus. You can't begin to, yes, when you're feeling weak, you're feeling everything, what do you do? You want to lie down and die. But once you begin to know and understand this dimension of the power, the presence, the authority of God, I tell you this, you will go and draw strength from Him. And then what will happen? You will go from strength to strength. In strength, you will go from faith to faith. In faith, you experience the peace of God that goes beyond human understanding. And that's when your life begins to manifest the glory of God. That's when you can begin to go from glory to glory. The glory within us. The glory that's waiting to overflow us. The glory of God that wants to come upon us. The glory of God that wants to bring His manifested presence. His unction, His anointing, the glory that want to strengthen you, the glory that want to transform you, the glory that want to change you. Wow. Worship. You see, worship is not depending on the circumstances and situations. Let me repeat this. Worship 
It's not dependent upon your circumstance, situation, not the problems you're facing. Worship arises because you know that He's God. He's God and all of angels, all of heavens even already know that. His will already is done in heaven. That's why they worship Him continually in heaven. But is when we begin to acknowledge and we begin His worship, we bring that heavenly dimension right now into our earthly realms, into our situations, into our circumstances, into our heaviness, into our tiredness. I tell you this, I've learned this. It took me a long time to learn it. But it doesn't mean that I'm in Christ. There's no problem. Jesus said, in this world you will have, he didn't say just problem. He uses the word tribulation. But he says, in me, you have peace. What's that peace? Not a peace that just comes at the end of problems. A peace that comes upon you, that goes beyond human understanding, that helps and encourage you, strengthen you, and enable you to go right through the problem. Amen. Amen. It's true. Because if you are facing a problem and feeling tired, you're feeling it, the more you look at it, what happens? The more the devil depletes. The more you become defeated. When you take your eyes off that and put it onto him as the author and finish your faith, as you begin to give thanks, as you begin to praise, there will come a point in time you will fall in worship. Because God's manifested presence then comes into every circumstance, every situation. Now you know why a lot of people don't walk in the 7,487 provinces. Because they have not yet come to the point of worshipping God. For He is God. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Now, in my thing you must remember, thanksgiving and praise, you notice as I've been teaching it in the last two sessions, is about utterance. Thanksgiving requires you to utter it out, to say it out. Praise requires you to sing it out, to proclaim it out, to declare it out. Amen. You don't praise me. Correct? Thanksgiving. No. If you are thankful, praise comes, there's utterance will come. Your life get changes. Your attitude change. If you can and even look at you and give you a lot of issues what I do. Praise the Lord. Amen. Because out of the abundance of your house, your mouth is speaking right now. Praise, thanksgiving. Utterance come when God is God in your life. Because now you're going to approach this. I won't tell you this. Worship is about a realization of who God is. Let me repeat this. Worship is about a realization of who God is. It's about an attitude that comes from your heart. And from the attitude of your heart, a posture comes in. Do you remember these words? Attitude. Very important. And I said, the attitude comes to bring a posture. You know, I like the hymn. How many remember the hymn? All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Prostrate, not prostrate. <laughs> prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. How many remember the song? Oh, I see some, some uh, traditional list around us. That's a tremendous hymn. You know, every time I remember that, I tell you, it's true. When you begin to hail the power of Jesus' name, something happens. Even the angels, when they understand it, they begin to fall. You know, when they give fall, what happens? Heads bow down. Hands opened and raised. Amen? How many of you experience this? And then it comes a point where you fall flat on your face. I tell you this, I, I believe this. 
Because God taught me this dimension when I first got saved in 1990. Do you know you never really worship God until you come to the point you feel God is so awesome that you will just fall on your face. I, I'm serious. I'm not talking about just you force yourself to fall. Because all of a sudden, it's about that. You know, and, and this is so important because sometimes I'll talk about this, about falling on our faces. And you know, as we do that, what do we do? We begin to worship God. There's such awareness all of a sudden that He's God. For another awareness that you become is He's holy. I want to tell you this. He's holy. There's none like Him. He is worthy because none can meet Him at His worthiness. And He's all power. Power and might. And none can match Him with this. And that He is all glory. Amen? Do you know the saints all understood it? You know what Moses said? I want to see your glory. Because he understood the glory is God himself. The manifested glory is about the anointing, the unction that can come upon your life, that will stir up that which God breathed into men from the foundations of the earth. And the glory of God will lift you up into a dimension to be the head and not the tail. To be above and not beneath. You know, we can verbalize it. But I want to challenge you. If you understand worship, you can experience it. Not just verbalize it, experience it. Do you know today, as I look, I think in our modern church, I use the word modern church, contemporary church, if you like, uh, we have lost the dimension of this worship. You know, I've gone to before I started the church, we, we were going around preaching in many churches. We had a network in Singapore alone, about 95 churches, and that's why I was being invited. And, and you know, some Sundays I went in to preach three churches, you know, some up to five services. But you know one thing? I realized not many churches have true worship. Yeah, they got good music, musicality, right tone, right everything. I really not worship. You know how I look? I look around. I see people would. No, I'm serious. They got papaya face. <laughs> they, got, they got faces like they took sour prune before they walked in. <laughs> Chinese with that, Kel Sen Wei Min. Like the prune face. And I, I begin to worry where, where is the joy? And often people just go through the motions. Motions of music, mm, worship, mm, 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 mm. mouth never even open, sound never come out. I'm like, yes, jump in the water. <laughs> no, I, I'm getting serious about it. You know, I realized, and it was from studying Derek Prince's books that I understood one thing very important that we cannot worship unless we understand. The nature of worship. That's what I'm trying to tell you today. What is the very nature of worship? We have not even understood. And we need to really be examining and reevaluating in our own lives. What are the steps we need to take to true worship? I told you the steps are very simple. They're told to us. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. Amen. You see, the steps are already there. And we need to understand how these steps are they brought into application. Amen. And you know that when we understand worship, how many know we can appropriate the fruit of worship in our life? Fruit of worship. I'll talk about this in a minute. But let's go now and try to understand what is the very nature of true worship. Sure, worship is coupled with praise. Praise for utterance, right? I said about it, right? But I'll tell you, we must understand something about worship. If you read the King James Version of Psalm 100, verse 2, he says, Serve the Lord with gladness. 
The NIV used the word worship the Lord with gladness. Do you know what I just sat down and said? God, why so confusing? Some say serve, some say worship. And then the Lord made me study the root word of the word down there in Psalm 100 verse 2. And you know the Hebrew word? Actually, that root word has this both worship and service. It's part and parcel. It's the same word that intertwined. Worship and service. And as I began to meditate on this, I began to understand something. Worship is tied up with service. Even Romans chapter 12, when Paul says, Brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord, which is, King James Version say, your reasonable service. NIV says, your act of worship. You see, what you do, how you live your life, is a worship to the Lord. Let me repeat this again. What you do and how you live your life is a worship to the Lord. And this is so important. Even Jesus alludes to it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. He said to the devil, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him shalt thou serve. Actually, in the New Testament, it talks about the same thing, worship and service. You know, I want to make this statement. Without worship, service is nothing but human effort. Let me say this again. Without worship, whatever service you do for the Lord is nothing but human effort. So important. Yet without service, worship is a hypocrisy. If you say you worship God and nothing comes out of that word of worshipping God, the way you live your life, the way you want to do things for God, I want to tell you, you are nothing but a hypocrite. I'm sorry. I understood that in 1990. Then all of a sudden I began to understand that as I serve the Lord, I'm worshipping the Lord. Yet I cannot serve the Lord without first learning to worship to approach His presence in my life. Many people are trying to serve the Lord by the strength of their arm. By your persistence and say, yes, I can do it. But it's only through God that God says, I can do all things. It is in your weakness, is His strength perfected. Amen? It, his strength is your weakness made complete. Somebody say, amen. So many of us, we serve, we serve. You know, I, I like the example of Gabriel. He's always <laughs> volunteering and serving. And I tell you this, when you're blonding and serving, God's eyes upon you all the time. And guess what? When you have a need, God already has a provision. Because apart from Him, we cannot. Without Him, we can accomplish nothing that's of worth in our lives. Somebody say amen. And I tell you something, when you have the actual worship, whatever you do is no more chore. Whatever you do becomes a joy. <laughs> I want to tell you this, I, I get people come and tell me, Pastor, I, uh, I'm really in church too many times. Do you know, let me tell you, when, when we first got saved, first the Lord taught us that we needed God all the time. Seven days, seven nights a week, we were running here and there. Wow, my favourite things like Mahjong, gone. My favourite things like golf, also gone. <laughs> no time also to go fishing anymore. Yeah, I, I used to love go fishing. Yeah. Do you know that my wife can tell you, every Saturday is a fishing day. If we cannot take the boat to go up, the children will know they went out with us. Then we are go pond and fish. <laughs> Do you know we, we get consumed with sometimes hobby, and yet we never get consumed with loving God. And it never became enough. Because I tell you, despite what we do, we learn to draw strength from God. People come and say, oh, you're tired. Pastor, so tired. They say, you are not learn to draw strength from God. In His presence. That's where the joy is, and that joy of the Lord will be your strength. Truth of Scripture, or truth of what you feel. 
You got to choose. When you press in, I'm going to tell you this. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. And that's true. Do you know when we were running house group from 1991 beginning, Monday night was where we had a prayer night. Every Monday night. Tuesday night, I was involved in some church meetings by the time I was church leadership. Wednesday, Thursday night, we were doing a ministry of counseling, healing, and deliverance. Why at night? Because everybody busy, so they come at night. Friday night, we had a house group. There was over 100 over strong every week. Saturday night was discipleship day. I was discipling two discipleship groups. And every Sunday was church day. For morning. I was in charge of a 9 o'clock service, 11 o'clock service, and a 7.30 service. In between, that we had a 2 o'clock, but there was later Chinese service was given independence. You know, we were in church from morning to night. I was not even paid. You know, it came to the point, pastors trusted me so much that, hey, uh, tonight, 7.30, uh, uh, you take charge, can? I'm very tired. Of course, uh, my responsibility. Hey, but he was a paid worker. Some pastors only do it because they're paid. No, we serve God from the abundance of thanksgiving, of praise, and our service is a worship for the Lord. Do you hear what I'm saying? And I tell you this, Jesus said, it is written that thou should worship the Lord thy God and is joined up together and Him shalt thou serve. You know, steps to worship we understood. Entering worship, just now I already talked about it. Enter with thanksgiving. But I'll look at now Psalm 95 and Change from Psalm 100, now look at Psalm 95. You know, Psalm 95 starts in verse 1 and saying, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Listen to the words again. Oh, come. Didn't say go. <laughs> How many know you must be able to come before you can go? <laughs> many times you only think, God, send me, send me, go, go, go. But if you have not yet learned to come, you won't be sent. And when you come, it's important. Who are you coming to? The words say, you come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise for what? To the rock of our salvation. Rock. Who's the rock of our salvation? Are you standing on sinking sand? Or are you standing on solid rock? I tell you this, I've learned something in faith that even with my eyes, when I see nothing but sinking sand around me. But when I have my existence in the Lord and my confidence in the Lord, what happens? I know that wherever the soul and feet touch, God has prepared solid ground. I won't tell you this. It's true. When God said my wife myself, go! You know, first place, show me go to India. Sometimes he will send us sometimes to the places we don't like to go. For some reason, he's never sent me to preach in America. Yeah. We got sent to some of the beautiful nations from South Africa, all parts of different Af parts of Africa, right of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar. I don't know, sometimes it's not about where we want to go. Is where does God want you to go? And I tell you, if you don't have that yieldness, surrenderedness, you're never ready to go. So, very important, not only did he begin to talk about this, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise. But I want to tell you something about worship. Worship, one day the Lord led me to Isaiah. I want to emphasize this point before I touch on, on this other part now. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2 to 3. And here Isaiah had a vision. In that vision, what did he see? He saw seraphims. Seraphims are fiery angels. Well, I don't know what it likes, but definitely fire around. But this seraphim has six wings. Very interesting. Six wings. And as looking, two wings was covering the face. Two wings were covering the legs. 
two wings cause it to fly. Do you know? It took me a long time before to understand why the six wings. And again, it was studying some of the teachings on this that I begin to see this revelation. You see, the face is always got talking about your face, your feet, how run to worship or not. You know what the Lord said? The two wings covering face too is about worship. The wings is about service symbolically. And in that, God was setting a ratio. How was the ratio? Two thirds of your life should be in worship. One third then in service. Write it down. Two thirds should be really in worship. And one third of your life then will be fruitful service. Amen. So now, let's go back here. And the word of God says, Rock of Salvation, let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. Then He says, For the Lord is great and a great King above all gods. In His hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is His also. The sea is His and He made it and His hand formed the dry land. When you understand this, then He says, Oh, come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pastures, and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear His voice. Now, we'll look at it later. Why today? But I think it's important here. We are keep understanding and I keep telling you, you want to worship God? It always comes with thanksgiving. It comes with praise. And the more exuberant, the more you learn to praise God, the more you fall into deeper worship with God. And you can never worship. Let me keep emphasizing again. Psalm 48, 1 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Have you come to the point of allowing and knowing that God is great? So, just very quickly, understand where to enter his gates with thanksgiving. As we go, we're to move further into his courts with praise, right? Now, however, what is worship? Worship is when we encounter God. You see, worship leads you to the second curtain. I mean, praise leads you to the second curtain in the tabernacle of Moses. When you part it, you move in the, the holy place. In the holy place, there are a few things. Brazen, uh, the, the menorah, the lighting. There is the table with shurubit, with frankincense sprinkled on it. And there's an incense where frankincense or is burnt. And that's where the fragrance is there. As you come in, it reminds you of two things. You cannot come in except... Already, the blood has been shed already through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the true light, but the Holy Spirit is the oil that brings illumination to the light. You can't come in except through the Word of God. I mentioned this last week. And in the Word of God, frankincense is bitter, but it's nice to smell, nice to look at. But in incense is when prayers of your saints really come for God. And then you go past the third curtain, into the holy of holies, into the presence of God. You know, God was showing us the way to go in. People want to jump, go right into the holy of holies. But if your heart is not prepared, you can't. Now, remember I said, worship is always about attitude, right? Attitude, why? When you know that God is a holy God. That's why God says, for I am holy, be thou holy. You see, I tell you why. It's only took me a long time to understand this. When I talk about wisdom, I know a lot of wise people. You know, I talk about greatness, I met great people. When I talk about power, I met people who are very powerful. Amen? But you know, apart from God, there is no demonstration of holiness. You see, holiness is not about 
how you just behave. Holiness is not about the guy that walks to church like a big halo and a big Bible. Holiness begins when your life wants to be set apart for God. How many know this? It's hard to be holy if you are so caught up with the things of the world. You're caught up with so much cares of the world. And do you know one thing about the physical posture? I alluded to it, lifting high of those, but it's when you come to a point that you fall flat on your face. I said I'll talk about this. Do you know if I believe this, I don't say this, if you have never fallen flat on your face before God, you might never have come into true worship in the presence of God. I'll repeat this again. If you have never come to a stage where you just want to feel, fall flat on your face before God, perhaps you never come in true worship before the Lord. You know, falling flat on your face, bowing your head, bowing the upper part of the body, it all speaks of humility. Humility can be imposed on us by the world. I shared this story about many years ago when I was doing business in Thailand. Our Thai people brought me to, to the palace because the, the princess wanted certain things of the products that we were doing, children's products. And it was, he told me the right thing that we must go and present it ourselves. And I shared how when we were there, all of a sudden the crown prince walked in, now present king. And we were seated on the floor. Then they brought a chair for him and seated there, and then he waved to us to come nearer to him. And I was, get up. Do you know, my distributor pulled me down. No, cannot get up. We had to shift, practically half crawl to go there. You see, if we can do it before a man, watch much more before our God. People are afraid of him getting on their knees because what will people think? I want to say this again. Until you have come to fall flat on your face, not just by your own act, but something happens, you have never really come to worship God. You know, how many read a book called The Pilgrim's Progress? Ah, wonderful book, allegory of the journey of faith, correct? Written by John Bunyan. Yeah. You know, one thing that John Bunyan had to say about this, he said about falling flat on the face. <laughs> I thought it was interesting. As I write down. He said, when you are on the floor, ha, listen, there's no lower place you can go. <laughs> it's true. You cannot fall huh, when you're really down posture before the Lord. Because when you do that, everything else goes. Your ego, your everything will go. And I tell you this, Another important thing for us, and I'm mindful of time, is that in worship, nothing happens if there's no truth involved. I'm looking at John chapter 4, verse 23, 24. Jesus said, but the hour cometh. And now is when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. For God is a spirit. For they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know, this is so important. If we don't understand this, that truth only becomes a reality when we live it. Write these verses down, John 8, 31, 32. John 8, 31, 32. Jesus said this to the believers. Only if you live the word, you abide in the word, or you are living out the word, then are you my disciples. It's then they will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Very important. Many people, truth doesn't set us free, although we can know it, head knowledge. And this is important. Now, the next thing I want you to understand, the truth of what you believe will be tested. Only the truth of God will stand the testing. You know, Leviticus chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says something. The testing is by fire. We see that in New Testament as well, right? Whatever thing will be tested by fire. In Leviticus chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, When you offer a meat offering unto the Lord, 
The offering shall be fine flour. He shall pour oil, which is symbolic Holy Spirit, upon it and put frankincense thereon. Now, very interesting. I always ask, why frankincense? You know, frankincense is important. I said earlier, you taste it bitter. Now, frankincense will put the fire produces sweet-smelling incense. You know this, the Lord was trying to teach the people of Israel. True worship is like that frankincense before God. As it's tested, then you worship it. Yet, it says, something are not to be put in. No meat offering which you bring the Lord shall be made with leaven. You know what's leaven, right? Yeast. Because yeast causes it to rise. But important, for you shall burn no leaven, nor any honey. For a long time I read that, I couldn't understand it. Then, somebody said this to me, have you know what happens when you burn honey? You never tried? You coat your chicken with honey to go in roast? When you get real fire, it burns. Isn't it true? And God is saying, honey, which you think is very nice, sweet, oh, no. God only wants things that stand the testing of fire. Whatever you believe, that's why God allowed problems to come to your life. Because the truth you believe in will be tested. What you believe in cannot become solid for you. Doesn't become the state that's driven into your life until it's been tested. And you can then know. Very quickly now, I mentioned about the fruit of worship. You know what's the fruit of worship? The fruit of worship is when you get united with God. Yes, yeah, true. When you begin to worship God, when you begin to acknowledge it's God, God inhabits your praises. God can throne your life. And what happened? God inhabits the praises. He comes into your life. And God becomes what? Part of your life. Remember, He's already in you if you're a believer. Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. But yet the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit coming out and coming upon you to bring empowerment in your life. And this is important. You see, it begins, however, in the natural. Everything begins in the natural. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 16 to 17 tells us, what do you not know that that is joined the prostitute? You remember those words? Becomes one. For two it said shall be one flesh. But he that's joined the Lord is one spirit. See this. There is a negative joining. When you join the wrong things, there's a soulish tie that's established. But also, when you are one the Lord, there is a spiritual tie and you become one with the Lord. Jesus, did He not tell us that I am the way, the truth, and the life? When you want the Lord and He is one the Lord, what happens? You're going to experience the fullness of all that God wants. In closing, I want to say this. But the choice is in our hands. I will repeat this again. The choice is in our hands. You make a choice. Do you want to enter the true worship before the Lord? Or do you want to stay in the outer courts? It's your choice. When you want to go into the presence of God to worship Him, no sin can exist. Not only that, no impure hearts and impure thoughts can exist. If you have not been conformed to the image of His Son, if you harbour a lot of things in your heart, you know what the warning was to some? Today, if you hear His voice, just now we read it, do not harden your hearts as they did at Meribah. Because of that, God was angry at them 40 years. What? They wondered. Their hearts go astray. You see, they're talking about believers. But have your heart gone astray? That's very important. 
There are people who have not known my ways. You see, God wants us to know His ways. And now the assurance. I will give you Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 23. But this is what I have commanded them, saying, Obey my voice and I'll be your God. You heard the teaching on worship, short though it may be. Understand that the worship prepares you to have a rest. A rest. But it's you who determine whether you enter into rest. When you enter rest, Hebrews chapter 4, 9 to 11 tells us, you will stop doing things your own way. <laughs> wow, I like that. And not only that, you start to do things as God desires. God has shown us. That's when you can boldly come before the throne of His grace. That is where you obtain mercy, He says, and find grace in a time of need. In worship, I ask you, you can't enter unless God is enthroned in your life. In worship, it only happens when you go past the gates, the outer courts, and into His very presence. And you cannot enter His presence without being ready in the attitude of worship. Amen. Today I hear this word. Today, life and death lies before you. Today, you understand this. God says, I came to give life and life abundantly. Today, I want you to hear this. The life abundantly is only available in the presence of Almighty God. I quoted just now, those that dwell in the secret place of the Most High, you shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Then you're able to declare, the Lord is my refuge and my fortress in Him will I trust. No matter what may come against you, nothing can separate you from the love of God our Father to Jesus Christ our Lord. You make the choice. You choose. You see, worship is not about Sunday only. Worship is how you live your life from Mondays to Sunday. Worship is about every day. Amen. I know some people, Sunday coming also a problem. But I want to tell you this. Your blessing is not only on a Sunday. God paid the price that it can be every day of your life. That you can walk in the provision, the abundance, and the providence of God all the time. Amen. Let's quiet our hearts now. Father, we give you thanks, we give you praise right now. Lord, I thank you for three simple words. Yet there's so much to understand and so much to fathom and so much, Lord, to apply. I pray even right now, Father, that what I've shared will be a seed sown on good ground. Holy Spirit, only you can prepare the ground. Only you can till the ground. Only you can, Lord, begin to, even right now, remove the hardness of our hearts. That you can peel back the layers that the devil wants to put around us, even the spiritual blindness and eyes, God. And I thank you, Lord. I declare to you be all glory, all honour and power. To you, all things increase, Lord. To you, the name of Jesus alone be lifted high. And Lord, as you increase, Lord, help us decrease before you. Help us to understand what it means to be on our face before you. Help, you, help us understand, God, that you made knees that you can bow, hands that can be lifted up, mouth that can begin to praise you, and hearts as receptacle of your love, and this we come to worship you. And we give you all glory, all thanks, all praise right now. 
in Jesus' precious name. Amen.